With the conclusion of the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, I've been trying to think of ideas on how to present to you all the problems this show has. And these problems aren't just with lore, continuity, or canon. These problems go all the way to the core of making a motion picture. The writing, directing, editing, and even the acting is so bad it shatters your brain into a million pieces every time you just think about it. You gotta understand what this has been like for me. I think through an idea, my head explodes, apply some back to spray. Think through an idea, head explodes, back to spray. Over and over. I can't seem to get past how stupid they made Bail Organa, but we'll get to him. With this series of videos, I would love to be able to present to you every single thing they've done to create more issues within the Star Wars galaxy. However, there are that many that I may miss some, so please feel free to head to the comments section to let me know what I missed. SHUT THE FUCK UP! So, let me officially welcome you to the series with a name inspired by Disparu. Blow me Obi-Wan Kenobi, I've lost all hope. Part 1, Qui-Gon Jinn. Ever since this series was announced, all the way up until the final episode of the series, there was a lot of talk and speculation on whether or not we were going to hear or see Liam Neeson as Qui-Gon Jinn. For me, there was really never any doubt. Disney wouldn't be able to help themselves. They jangled the keys and used the nostalgia of Qui-Gon Jinn to try and get the Star Wars fan boner erect. That was a cheap move. Now, of course, I don't have a problem with Qui-Gon being in the series. It would make sense that 10 years after Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan would still be learning from him. But what they ended up doing was destroying more lore, continuity, and canon. Not to mention how bad the interaction and dialogue is between these two characters considering their history. As most Star Wars fans would know, Qui-Gon was known as a bit of a rogue Jedi. From a certain point of view. A venerable if maverick Jedi Master, Qui-Gon Jinn is a student of the Living Force. Unlike other Jedi Masters who often lose themselves in the meditation of the unifying Force, Qui-Gon Jinn lived for the moment, espousing the philosophy of Feel, don't think, use your instincts. Were it not for Qui-Gon's unruly views, he would undoubtedly be on the Jedi Council. But those unruly views that Qui-Gon had would lead him to the path of immortality. For all Qui-Gon's so-called flaws, he was actually more of a Jedi Master than most of the Jedi Masters on the Council combined. He was correct in his beliefs, his actions, his motivations, and he was correct about Anakin being the Chosen One. He was a true Jedi Master. This is the kind of Jedi that all other Jedi aspire to be. They just never knew it. Like all Jedi of his era, Obi-Wan Kenobi was raised in the Jedi Temple from a very young age. Kenobi first underwent training with Yoda as a youngling, before being assigned to Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn in his teens. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon forged a very strong bond, though Kenobi was a more faithful follower of the Jedi Code than his master, who preferred to follow the will of the Living Force in his conscience. Despite their slight difference in philosophy, Obi-Wan spent 13 years as an apprentice to Qui-Gon Jinn. Over that time, their bond grew very strong, as it does for most masters and apprentices. But you would also think that their differences in philosophy would come to an end after Obi-Wan realized Qui-Gon was right all along at the end of Revenge of the Sith. It's amazing, everybody always speculates what would have happened to Anakin if Qui-Gon had never been killed. I'd like to propose the question, how powerful of a Jedi Master would Obi-Wan have become if Qui-Gon had never been killed? You can also see their connection and how close they were when Qui-Gon dies. As anyone would, Obi-Wan was clearly shattered, and of course, Qui-Gon with his dying breath asks Obi-Wan to train Anakin, and Obi-Wan was willing to go against the Council's wishes to train him to keep his promise to his master. I gave Qui-Gon my word. I will train Anakin. <clears throat> Without the approval of the Council, if I must. I'd say that's a pretty close bond. So far, I haven't told you anything you don't already know if you've watched the movies. But let's go into some things you may not know. Now, before you all jump in the comments section and say, The EU isn't canon and never was! Let me explain. I'm bringing the EU up for two reasons. First, because the EU is where the writers got their inspiration for their creative freedom to make this shit show. And I think it's only fair that we compare the two. And second, because the EU is fucking canon. Listen, let me put it to you this way. If you fucktards out there are allowed to have your stupid fucking retarded headcanon, well then so am I. And my headcanon is the EU. With that out of the way, Move, bitch, get out of my way. throughout Obi-Wan's first year on Tatooine, it's referenced in the Kenobi novel that he's always trying to commune with Qui-Gon, asking for his help and guidance with a small problem he's dealing with on Tatooine. Throughout all of that, Qui-Gon never appears to him or speaks to him. 
I always thought that was because that's not Qui-Gon's mandate. He shouldn't be interfering. He should be allowing the Force to flow through Obi-Wan and allowing Obi-Wan to follow the Living Force. And that makes even more sense when he finally does speak to Obi-Wan again. And I say again because it's also revealed in this novel that Qui-Gon spoke to both Yoda and Obi-Wan on Polis Massa at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Meditation. The package is delivered. I hope you can read my thoughts, Master Qui-Gon. I haven't heard your voice since that day on Polis Massa, when Master Yoda told me I could commune with you through the Force. This is also the only place I can find a reference of that particular conversation. But throughout the story, no matter how hard Obi-Wan tries, Qui-Gon never once interferes or speaks to him. He finally does speak to him, however, at the end of the Rise of Darth Vader novel, which runs parallel in the timeline with the Kenobi novel. After Obi-Wan has finally settled in on Tatooine, approximately a year after Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan is in a bar in Mos Eisley and sees a report on the holonet that Lord Vader hunted down a band of Jedi on Kashyyyk. In that moment, he realizes that Vader is still alive and starts to freak out, as he was under the assumption that Anakin, or Vader, died on the shores of Mustafa. The burst of static that accompanied the reporter's mention of the figure's identity might have surged from Obi-Wan's brain. Still chilled by the earlier announcement about the Jedi, he was now paralyzed by sudden dread. He couldn't have heard what he thought he heard. He whirled to the spaceport worker. What did she say? Who is that? Lord Vader, the man said, all but into his glass of brandy. Obi-Wan shook his head. No, that's not possible. Obi-Wan starts to freak out, thinking to himself, how could he possibly bring Luke to Tatooine of all places? As impossible as it seemed, Anakin had survived Mustafar and had resumed the Sith title of Darth Vader. How could Obi-Wan have been so foolish to bring Luke here, of all worlds? Anakin's homeworld, the grave of his mother, the home of his only family members. He starts to think he should take Luke and run even further away. From the far side of the street, he shadowed Owen and Maru as they moved from store to store, stocking up on staples. Should he warn them about Vader? Should he take Luke away from them and hide him on an even more remote world in the Outer Rim? His fear began to mount. His and Yoda's hopes for the future dashed. This is when Qui-Gon finally speaks to Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. He came to an abrupt halt. It was a voice he hadn't heard in years, speaking to him not through his ears, but directly into his thoughts. This moment. The moment that's relevant to both Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan's mandate. Master, is Darth Vader Anakin? Yes. Although the Anakin you and I knew is imprisoned by the dark side. I was wrong to leave my Mustafa. I should have made sure he was dead. The Force will determine Anakin's future. Obi-Wan, Luke must not be told that Vader is his father until the time is right. Should I take further steps to hide Luke? The core of Anakin that resides in Vader grasps that Tatooine is the source of nearly everything that causes him pain. Vader will never set foot on Tatooine, if only out of fear of reawakening Anakin. After Qui-Gon puts Obi-Wan at ease, it would seem that Obi-Wan is now content with his mandate of watching over Luke and essentially becoming a hermit. Obi-Wan exhaled in relief. Then my obligation is unchanged. But from what Yoda told me, I know that I have much to learn, Master. You were always that way, Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon's voice faded, and Obi-Wan's fears began to dissipate replaced by renewed expectation. As you can see, that tells a very good, cohesive story that holds true to the lore and canon of Star Wars. Before we get right into the garbage they put together with Qui-Gon, I want to do one other small comparison here, and that is Obi-Wan's realization that Vader is still alive. As I mentioned, in the EU, it was a year after Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan was in a bar, saw it on the holonet, freaked out, and Qui-Gon put him at ease. In the Kenobi show, Reaver is the one that reveals that to him. Lord Vader will be pleased. You didn't know. He's alive, Obi-Wan. Anakin Skywalker is alive. How does she know Vader is Anakin? <laughs> I don't know. Well, before Anakin stabbed her in the Jedi Temple, she heard a clone trooper call him Lord Vader. Fuck off. 
Nobody knows. Nonetheless, she is the one that tells him that Vader is still alive. Now, I've got nothing to criticize Ewan McGregor's performance in showing the shock Obi-Wan would have to that news. The problem I do have is that this is 10 years after Revenge of the Sith. 10 years, man! We're led to believe that Obi-Wan spent 10 years on Tatooine and has no idea what's going on in the galaxy. I know Tatooine is a backwater planet that's controlled by the hearts and that the Empire doesn't care about, at least until Disney took it over. But the fact that he hasn't heard any news about Vader or the Empire in 10 years 10! is absolutely pathetically ridiculous. It's like they hit pause on the universe around them for 10 years. 10 years! Think of the Earth, yes, the entire Earth as the entire Star Wars galaxy. Now let's say all the countries on Earth are all the systems within that galaxy, and then all the states within those countries are all the planets within those systems and all the cities and towns in those states are all the cities and towns on those respective planets now think of some of the biggest news events you've ever seen throughout your life you don't think some of that news found its way to some of the backwater places on earth especially with how technology is today and think of the technology they have in the Star Wars universe you could almost say the writers have no idea how the Star Wars universe works. But also the new characters, the new energy, being able to add new stuff to canon and new stuff to Star Wars. It's like, you know, it's a great honor to be able to do that. So I'm excited to see new stuff too. They actually found a way to remove the realities of the Star Wars universe from the universe. So it's like nothing's happened between the end of Revenge of the Sith and the beginning of the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Other than the fact that he's cut himself off from the Force, when completely away from his mandate. In your solitude on Tatooine, training I have for you. And got a job. But that's my point. He as a character has progressed or decomposed over time, but nothing else in the universe around him has happened or changed. Or you could say, affected his perspective on things since the end of Revenge of the Sith. I'd also like to ask, how does Obi-Wan know this? It wasn't always like this here. There were fields and families, and then the Empire came in and ravaged it all. Or this. Who were they? Inquisitors. Many were Jedi who turned to the dark side. Now they hunt their own kind. But has no idea that Vader is still alive and the Empire's Enforcer. Actually think about that. He knows that this random planet has been ravaged by the Empire, and he knows what Inquisitors are and what their purpose is. But he has no idea that Vader is still alive in 10 years. 10, 10 years? So, how did they decide to bring Qui-Gon into the series and what kind of wisdom did he bestow upon Obi-Wan? Master Qui-Gon. Well, took you long enough. Beginning to think you'd never come. I was always here, Obi-Wan. You just were not ready to see you. Come on, you've got a ways to go. Okay, first let's talk about the timing of his arrival. They bring him in right at the end of the series. Everything's done. Leia is safe, Bale is safe, Luke is safe, and Obi-Wan is safe. And Reva knows everything. So we're kind of back to where we started, other than Reva knowing everything. So there was really nothing they could give him to help Obi-Wan when he's already conquered the challenges he had throughout this series. So all they made Qui-Gon say was... Beginning to think you'd never come. I was always here, Obi-Wan. You just... were not ready to see you. Like it's on Obi-Wan or something. That is Qui-Gon's ability. He can speak to Obi-Wan whenever he needs to. But once again, this is another example of how they've pushed pause on the universe around the characters. Because they had no real explanation for why Qui-Gon wasn't already speaking to Obi-Wan. This would also seem to be their first interaction since Polis Massa, and that's if they've kept that in the Disney canon. Either way, this would seem to be their first interaction in at least 10 years. 10! 10! YEARS! 10 YEARS! That's right, Obi-Wan spent 10 years on Tatooine becoming a hermit, cutting himself off from the Force, not training, and Qui-Gon never once thought to ask, what the fuck are you doing? Now, there were people out there saying it might have been better to bring him in just before he faced Vader in that final episode. Where are you going, Obi-Wan? I'm going to pick a fight. 
or even after he gets crushed under the rocks to give him some motivation. I personally still like the idea of Qui-Gon not interfering. He is there to help Obi-Wan find the path to peace so he can become one with the Force. That and protecting Luke should be the only two things he speaks to Obi-Wan about. So I don't really mind them bringing him in at the end, but it was just completely pointless. Personally, where I would have liked to have seen Qui-Gon first come in would have been when Bail went to Tatooine to talk to Obi-Wan about Leia. He would say, what the fuck are you doing here, Bail? Piss off. And Obi-Wan? Stay on target. Stay on target. But in the context of what they're doing with this series, there was definitely way better spots to bring Qui-Gon into it. Even when he was just sitting there holding his lightsaber, once again trying to commune with Qui-Gon would have been better. Next, let's talk about the dialogue and interaction these two characters had. I've already told you that there was really no point for Qui-Gon to show up in this moment. I also mentioned earlier that this would seem to be their first interaction. Beginning to think you'd never come. I'm gonna come. Whether that's since Polis Massa or since Qui-Gon's death makes no difference. It's been a fucking long time. And with how strong their bond was, you would think there would be a bit more than this stupid comedic, what took you so long? Well took you long enough. Let me give you an example of something they could have done. I want to be clear here though, I think none of this should be fucking happening in the first place. Master, where have you been? I really could have used your help these last few days. Obi-Wan, if I do that, how are you to follow the living force? Master, I failed. I failed you. I tried to train Anakin and all it did was lead us to darkness. I should have killed him. <laughs> yes, Obi-Wan, both times. But the Force will determine Anakin's fate. Master, is Luke still safe and has Reva become a threat? Well, you probably should have killed her, but Luke is safe for the moment. Anyway, you get the idea, and that's based on the fact that this is the first time they've spoken to each other in at least 10 years. Based on the bond and history that these two characters have, you would think that they would give us a bit more than what they did. And this really does go to show how much the creators misunderstand these characters and how bad the writing really is. The last thing we need to take a look at is Qui-Gon's actual physical appearance. Now while the timing of Qui-Gon's appearance is bad and the dialogue and interaction between these two characters is bad, these things are more illogical and stupid than they are, let's say, super destructive. But his actual physical appearance does actual damage to Star Wars canon and the lore around Qui-Gon Jinn. This is not only something that contradicts what the creator has actually said about Qui-Gon becoming one with the Force, but this also contradicts Disney's own canon. In The Clone Wars Season 6, Yoda goes on his own little adventure, guided by Qui-Gon. Yoda actually asks him the question... Show yourself, can you? And this is Qui-Gon's answer... I cannot. My training was incomplete. This is something that has been very well known amongst the fan base for a very long time. It has always been established that Qui-Gon was on the right path, but didn't complete the training to be able to manifest himself. Now, there is the episode on Mortis where he actually does physically appear, but that's an anomaly. First, Mortis is a conduit for the Force and seemingly in a different realm. What is this place? Unlike any other, a conduit through which the entire Force of the Universe flows. If it is actually him, it is explained this place amplifies the Force, which in turn would amplify Qui-Gon's ability. This planet is both an amplifier and a magnet. But in Obi-Wan's case, it was like a Force vision within Mortis. And in both cases, you could make the argument that it was just the brother manipulating both Anakin and Obi-Wan. But again, if it is actually him, it is explained that this place amplifies the Force, which in turn would amplify Qui-Gon's ability. And remember, the whole time they were on Mortis, no time went by in the real world. We were worried. You were off the scopes there for a moment. A moment? <laughs> well, we've been gone more than a moment, Rex. Sir, I don't understand. You'll need to explain. What they did by having Qui-Gon actually physically appear is a clear insult. It's an insult to George. I sold them to the white slavers that take these things and... And, uh, <laughs> okay, but the fans and anyone that likes canon, lore, and continuity in any form of sci-fi or fantasy. It's a clear indication that the people creating Star Wars really, really don't get it, but they don't even care to make an effort to learn it. To all the SEALs out there championing this, you should be ashamed of yourselves. This is direct lore that we've heard from the creator himself. This is lore that you've known for a very long time. And this is also lore that they decided to retcon from the old canon and their own canon. And you're okay with this? 
You have now become a part of the problem. Shame on you. This is what Kathleen Kennedy, John Favreau, Dave Filoni and Disney Lucasfilm has decided to do with the legacy of Star Wars. With George's legacy. These are my kids. So All those Star Wars films. All the Star Wars films. They were your kids. Yeah, well, they are my, you know, I, I loved them, I created them. The one thing this man dedicated his whole life to creating for us, and they tear the law, canon, and the continuity to the ground in 10 years. A lifetime to build and a decade to destroy. And for what? Oh, that's right, creative freedom. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you in part two, where we're going to take a look at how bad of a job they did with Bail Organa. Later, guys. Go home, sugar bear. Go home.